know, I'm just going to have someone like plant Kevin Smith's name over our names, right? As the end of the week. Because <laughs> it's my fault this time. Listen, I was just about to say it. Like, all I got to do is have my wife take a picture of me doing something like this. And like my my new job has been so stressful and, and busy. But I, I swear I'm, I'm going to get it uh, to the fans wondering what my color lightsaber one day you'll find out. Then yeah, one day you'll find out. Yeah. But anyway, welcome to the Jedi Way. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, clicking play on this video or clicking play on the uh, podcast episode of this uh, of this show. We appreciate it madly. I am the outlaw John Roca, sometimes known as Roca Fett, joined by these two wonderful people. Let's start with Laura Kelly. How are you doing, Laura Kelly? How are you feeling? I'm doing amazing. So I'm a little bit tired. I've been attending the Chicago International Film Fest this week. Ooh, nice. Chicago's Film Fest is like almost two weeks long it's very mm. long i saw like six movies in wow. a very short amount of time and i've got three or four more this weekend okay. but i've seen some great stuff so i'm really enjoying it but i'm happy to have a little bit of a break from it and hang out with you guys <laughs> are there any is there any you can mention that are like you were you were surprised how great it was or that you're really happy you enjoyed sure it? Yeah, so there's a there was a film called The Promised Land with Mads Mikkelsen. Uh, oh, it was okay. a Danish movie, and he's fantastic in it. I think okay. it's based on a true story. It's like this historical thing, this whole thing that happened in like the 1700s in Denmark. I don't know, but it was fantastic, and he was okay. fantastic in it. And then a French film that has Juliette Binoche in it. Um, that is just we were just talking about cooking shows. Um, it is a whole movie that has like there's a 40 minute opening credits cooking sequence wow. that I thought was going to be like overwhelming, but it was amazing. But yeah, if you are into French film and if you like Juliette Binoche, Binoche as an actress, it's very typical Juliette Binoche role, but it's very good. Um, and that one was called The Taste of Things. It's very Taste excellent. of Things. Okay. Putting it on the list. Yeah. yeah. The San Diego Film Festival is happening right now. So I'm going to go see American oh. Fiction tomorrow night, the one with Jeffrey Wright. And then um, the one with Nicolas Cage, Dream Scenario, where he's popping up in people's dreams. Yes. That's going to yes. be Saturday night. So those are the only two that really stood out to me, and I couldn't get into holdovers with Giamatti, so I missed out on that. But the other two I'm looking forward to. So that's great to hear that you're doing that. Uh, and, of course, Kevin Smets uh, coming from sunny San Diego downtown. Kevin, how are you? How are you feeling? Good. I'm feeling good. Uh, I've been liking the lull of Star Wars. Uh, mm. I Now that we're having a long break, uh, I'm doing this thing. Uh, if I, I made this list. It's my Star Wars Super Watch, and it's okay. straight up like Ooh. chronological – but I pick a couple things that are legends that I consider canon, like the Plagueis novel, Laura. But uh, <laughs> so basically, uh, like it starts with like Tales of the Jedi, the Dooku Jedi episodes with young Qui-Gon. Then there's a couple Age of Republic comic shorts, which if you look on YouTube, you can actually people make like animated like eight minute, like they'll they'll voice it, score wow. it and do sound design for it. Okay. And so there's episodes like that happened before Phantom Menace about Qui-Gon and, and Maul, like eight minute little short, like basically like cartoons, although it's it's just the comic book on screen. Right. And then like, this is how crazy I get. Like the Plagueis novel starts before Phantom Menace, but then it stops at a certain point where then they're like, oh, I dispatched two Jedi to the planet of Naboo. So then you stop and then you got to watch Phantom Menace and then you stop Phantom Menace in the middle to go to Tales of the Duke, Tales of the Jedi Dooku episode Whoa. that happens right when Qui-Gon comes back from the Jedi thing. And then like the Plagueis novels create like nuts. There's a famous scene in Phantom Menace where something's happening like just off screen. It's very Back to the Future part two. So then you got to go back to Plagueis <laughs> novel and read that. So I'm doing all of this stuff and I made this super watch list wow. and I'm just going to plow through it. It's 64 items. Of course, some items are going to take a lot longer. Like when you get to uh, 18, item 18 is the Clone War series. So Oof. that's going to uh -huh. really stop me in my tracks. But uh, it's going to be fun. By the And I I think it'll probably take me like a year. So I think there'll be a new wow. Star Wars show before then. But uh, it's, That's it's amazing. Fun. That takes a lot of coordination to handle all of that. That's like so impressive. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting about it. And I'll just mention this because I know we, we got to get to the show. Mm. When I first showed my wife, uh, Phantom Menace. Mm -hmm. um, and leading up to, she had nuts in the prequels, and it was right after Tales of the Jedi came out. So I did the thing where right in the middle of Phantom Menace, I, I stopped it. I'm like, you got to watch this now, this happening like concurrently. And we had watched the Dooku episodes before, so she knew who Dooku was and how he was being disenfranchised with the Senate and, and the Jedi's involvement with the Senate. Mm -hmm. So then when Dooku shows up and then is mad about Qui-Gon dying, and then the fall, by the time he shows up in episode two, she's like oh there's dooku and totally understands his motivations and mm. like why he's there and it's, it's an interesting thing um and it took me forever to like come up with this like very specific thing and like you said like 
Yeah, it's like all and like imagine my wife, like I'm stopping it and I'm like, I gotta load up this cartoon to show you. <laughs> she must be like, What the heck's the matter with you? But it's really fun, and there's some really cool content about uh, Anakin and Obi-Wan's first missions together. There was a comic series called uh, Obi-Wan and Anakin, um, where they're really uh, the growing pains of like how he's still like a kid, and a lot of interesting stuff you never hear about, like how he was kind of like an outcast with the kids, yeah. the other kids. Yeah. He would sit on the side, like in that room with Liam with the shades. He would be off to the side because he was way ahead of everybody else. And the other kids would kind of be mean to him and stuff, but or right. be scared of him, like and like you know what I mean, because he was so powerful or whatever. It's just kind of like if a you know teacher's pet or whatever gets kind of made fun of or whatever. And Anakin shows his dark side a little bit as a kid. So there's really cool stuff, and it's going to be the most complete thing. I just I wanted to fill my time to keep my brain in the, the galaxy far, far away in this long wait, you know? So um, I think by the time I finish this, Matthew Vaughn will have rebooted all of it off the start. <laughs> There's, your segue, John. There's your segue. Nice. Well done, Kevin. Oh, we got on the ramp. We got on that ramp to get off the highway. I appreciate it. Uh, fans, yeah, that is if you want to see my super watch list, let me know. I'll, I'll figure out a way to, to post it on my Twitter or whatever. If people could see it, it's, it's very intense. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. And uh, speaking of intense, uh, let's get into what uh, Kevin was talking about here. We're going to get into a couple of things uh, in this episode. We're going to talk about Matthew Vaughn's recent comments about Star Wars, get everyone's thoughts on that. And we're going to hit a Screen Rant article here and talk about it. This one is called 10 Biggest Missed Opportunities in the Star Wars TV shows. We've just wrapped up Ahsoka. We've got a little bit of time, as Kevin and Laura said, a little bit of a lull here. So let's look back on these things and talk about them. And we might even suggest some of our own personal missed opportunities from these Star Wars TV shows here on this particular episode. But let's go over to the Matthew Vaughn story first. Uh, and this one comes to us. Uh, he's uh, obviously pushing or uh, promoting, rather, Argyle. Pushing, I'm sure, as well. But promoting Argyle as the director of that movie. Of course, he's directed the Kingsman movies and a few other films as well. And he was on the Happy, Sad, Confused podcast hosted by one of the former Schmodown contestants, Josh Horowitz. And he was asked about Star Wars and he came up with this or he answered this question talking about Star Wars. He said the, he would like to reboot the Star Wars franchise, likening his idea to the James Bond films or other superhero films where other creatives put their spin on familiar stories. Here's his quote. For me, doing a Star Wars movie is to play with the characters I love. If they said to me they'd reboot Star Wars and actually have Luke Skywalker solo and Vader and do your version of it, everyone would say you're an idiot to try but that would excite me. And he further went on to speculate about the original trilogy and recasting and said, why are the Star Wars characters so hallowed that from 1977, you can't redo it for a new audience? Star Wars is the Skywalker family, and that's where I think they're, they've gone wrong. They forgot. They've done brilliantly in TV, but it needs an epic new film. That's what I would do. Everyone is going to go batshit crazy, but let's bring it on. If you want a new generation, make the movie for them. The old generation, hopefully you make it well enough that they enjoy it. So a lot of comments here, Laura, talking about Star Wars, rebooting Star Wars, recasting these iconic characters from the original trilogy. What are your thoughts when you hear these comments from director Matthew Vaughn? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, I Okay, so first of all, I like Matthew Vaughn's movies. I love all the Kingsman movies. Mm -hmm. So I would... The idea, though, of him directing a Star Wars is not for me, I don't think. I don't okay. think that's a movie that would be for me or a show or whatever um the way that he talks about it is like wanting to basically play in the sandbox with his action figures and i think we have enough men serving as showrunners in star wars who are coming to it with that exact same approach and i don't think <laughs> that we fair. need no, i whether you consider it a good or a bad thing is right. up to you but i think we have enough of that and i don't think we need to add any more to it um, I think the other big thing I took away from this is his comment about how Star Wars is the Skywalkers, which, sure, I think it's actually the other way around, though. The Skywalkers are Star Wars, but Star Wars is Ooh. so much more than just the, than just the Skywalkers. Right. So, I, I mean, as somebody who enjoys all of the canon novels and is just living for the High Republic right now, because that's literally all there is um like that it's just it's so much bigger than this than the skywalkers now and if you're not keeping up with the canon i can understand how somebody would maybe be ignorant of that and that's fine but i just don't i, I don't know star wars transcends the skywalkers it needs to be about more than that and just 
the really the whole thing on top of it all is just that we don't need to reboot the original trilogy. I just don't think anybody needs that. We just I, we don't need it. Um, so I'm coming at it from a few different points of view, but I think that's my sort of overarching point. But I'm very curious to hear what you guys think of this and mm. what your sort of how what your thoughts are just on Matthew Vaughn in general and his films. Yeah, Kevin, uh, Kevin take it away. I mean, I I in his defense, hmm. okay, and I don't think they should reboot it either. I mean, for me, I'm like, yeah, why not? They reboot it. Let's see it. Like, whatever. Like, um, but just because I like to see what artists, uh, other artists' interpretations of it would be. Hmm. But I mean, I know it's crazy talk because the original trilogy is dear to me, and I believe that he is an old school fan. Laura, mm -hmm. you're younger than him. You're younger than me. I'm an old man. Roca, you're old too. But I mean, I think I'm How dare you? I'm, I'm in my prime. Go ahead, yes. <laughs> um, I think he doesn't know about the High Republic. I think he probably oh, thinks yeah. that is a, a, a cannabis bar in Amsterdam. So I think- Oh yeah, no, and I don't expect him to, honestly. Yeah, and I think for some people that aren't like us that, you know, just I just told you how I'm going to watch this whole thing that includes everything. It's not the Skywalker stuff. Yeah. Whereas- I think for him, the non super fans to them, it is Skywalker, and that's okay. Like, because maybe they only watch the original trilogy or they watch the first six or just the movies in there. They're not watching the shows. They don't know what Rebels is or they don't even know what Ahsoka is or Ahsoka. Like, they, they don't know, right? So for, for Matthew Vaughn to say that, like, I think he's just thinking, like, as terms, he's an old school mentality of like, he's not thinking of Star Wars as a cinematic universe he's thinking it as the movies he loved as a kid and he'd love to read he'd love to reboot it like he already re kind of did a soft reboot although it was in the same universe with um x-men and x-men mm. first class was fantastic by the way you know and but those were taking characters at a younger age so it's interesting that he did he wouldn't be up for utilizing these characters and doing another movie with it but you know if he has his own way of like how he would do Darth Vader's turn or, you know, the, the, a new hope. And I mean, there again, empire is on such hollow ground. A, a new hope is on such hollow ground. Return of the Jedi. Like we, we feel so protective of these things. And I know a lot of people like hated the ghost, but like there's some reboots that like people, the RoboCop reboot, total recall ghostbusters, right. like people were crapping on it. I get it. But like, there's other ones that are re like Scarface is a remake. Like, yes. and that's like one of the greatest movies of all time. So like, there there are certain things now i think with star wars i mean matthew vaughn god bless the man that guy has you know cojones to say that he just i'd reboot it and that makes me respect him like i know i'm probably on an island here but i respect him like i would love to see what his fantasy booking is for a star wars trilogy Ooh. you know with yeah. those characters um but i don't think they need to do it it's just like back to the future would i love new back to the future movies and, and but like bob gale has said famously like They'll never, I would never want to reboot it. And now they're talking about it. Indiana Jones, they'll never reboot it, even yeah. though they could have gone the James Bond route with that. So yeah. um, I think there are just some movies that, but then again, I think in 50 years, like, you know what I mean? I mean, I in 50 years, maybe something will be rebootable at that point. You know what I mean? Like, you never know. But yeah, I mean, again, and then I know it's kind of different, but like everybody loved Michael Keaton's Batman so much, right? But mm -hmm. we, if they didn't ever reboot it, if they were like, no, we can never do another cinematic Batman, we would have never gotten Batman Begins and Dark Knight and Nolan's trilogy, right? So like sometimes, you know, but again, with Star Wars, when you're now creating a universe anyway, where everything is connected, you have canon novels, you have canon shows, but like you can't really do that without it making, doing like an Elseworlds, like how the Todd Phillips Joker movie would be or something like that. But yeah, what do you think, Roka? Yeah, it's an interesting question. First of all, I do like Matthew Vaughn, but I think he's an uneven filmmaker, right? Like I like Layer Cake, and I like Stardust and I like Kick-Ass, but I'm not the biggest fan of X-Men First Class, even though a lot of people like it. I like Kingsman, The Secret Service. I didn't like The Golden Circle. I thought Kingsman was okay. And I haven't seen Argyle, but the, the trailer looks good. But will it mean it's a good movie? I don't know. So I've got you know a little bit of a track record, interesting track record with Matthew Vaughn as a director. That being said, I, I wouldn't hand him a legacy film. I just wouldn't hand him a canon massive legacy film. So I'm in Laura's camp on that. And I do think, I agree with you, Kevin, that it is not time to reboot the original trilogy. I think maybe 50, 75 years down the road, you can broach that subject. And the reason I bring that up is because and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, uh, reference the other franchise here, but we saw what happened 
with Star Trek Into Darkness, which was a remake of Wrath, remake of Wrath of Khan, and people were incredibly pissed. Star Trek fans at that situation. So I think people would be pissed if you rebooted the original trilogy when it when Mark Hamill is still effing alive. Like I just don't think it's the time to do it. And Harrison Ford's still alive. I don't think it's the time to do it at all. But recasting the characters and exploring other stories with these characters, I'm 100% on board with that. I am yes. down to see Leia in her teen years or Leia as a senator dealing with Hera, dealing with Han, who's constantly wanting to run everywhere, dealing with being a mom, a working mom. That's interesting stuff to me. And what she's doing, her and Mon Mothma and the political machinations, that's interesting. Luke, a yeah. young teenage Luke coming of age. There's a lot to be interested in. You could come bring back uh, Edgerton and, um, oh, I can't remember the actress's name from, uh, she was in the Nexium cult for a while. I can't remember her name, but you could bring her back and give her more to do and have that interaction there with them. That could be interesting. Or Luke later on after Jedi, what is he doing? Uh, you know, where is he? How is he setting up the schools? Have you seen in Ahsoka? What are those years like teaching all of that? So there's a lot to explore Han as well. Uh, and we're getting Lando at some point. So there's a lot to explore here. So I'm not as crazy about recasting these legacy characters. So I like Matthew's point of view there, but rebooting the trilogy. And as you said, Laura, so well, having these men come in and, and look like they're playing in a sandbox. I don't want any of that. I, I don't want any of that. And not yet. Let's, let's go way, way further down the road. Cause there are so many stories to tell in the star Wars universe. Why would we waste money rebooting the original trilogy when it is still so beloved and still getting introduced to new generations of Star Wars fans? It doesn't make sense. You know? Exactly. Um, Especially now that you've got Disney Plus that's out there. And you're right. All of these young fans are discovering these things for the first time yeah. with a resource like that. So I think that, that I think you're right. I think that's a good point to bring into it is that. One more yeah, counterpoint. There, and again, I'm not pushing for a reboot. Okay. Yeah. I'm not pushing for a reboot. But there are some. Uh, young people that like the second they see an old movie or an oldish movie sure right they're like oh and like a new hope for all it's perfect shit right like right. there's long shots it's like, especially if you're i mean if you're watching the original original like the special edition cleaned it up a lot but i think for some people they might dismiss it and be like oh, i don't want to watch an old movie from the 70s you know what i mean so i get where he's coming from and i'm just giving him respect just so everyone in the comments doesn't blow me up like they do when i say that obi-wan's my favorite show <laughs> Okay, like I'm not asking them to reboot it, but uh, I am giving respect to the man for at least saying, like, look, he loves, he would like to have his own stab at it. Like yeah. the the balls on that guy, right? Yeah, so yeah. speaking of Scarface, right? Let's hey -oh, hey -oh. <laughs> uh, all right, there you go. Great points for sure. So we'll see what happens. But I mean, I think we are. I think Disney has been slowly getting us used to the idea of recasting these characters. I mean, they already the big one was, of course. Alden Ehrenreich being recast as Solo. Then we have Donald Glover coming in to play Lando in the same film. We just had an eight-year-old, 10-year-old Leia in the Kenobi series. And we had Leia mentioned a lot in the Ahsoka series, or a number of times in the Ahsoka series. So I think they're war And we've seen Luke ai or cgi whatever you want to say, there a couple of times in The Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett. So to me, I think they're slowly opening the door to recasting all this stuff um down the road and getting us used to it and like you said kevin i think just waiting for maybe one more generation to come through and then they're just going to drop uh, everything and start doing that and deal to with the hits. Marty mcfly not not your kids are going to love it right like they, <laughs> yeah, exactly. here is here is kids might be like i'm not watching a 1977 movie that's like <laughs> you know what i mean and then yeah. maybe they'll do a 3d hologram reboot Sorry, Ryan Gosling's grandchild. As long as it's not AI, I'm okay with it. For sure. <laughs> um, all right. Well, let's take a quick break here. I know it's a little bit early in the show, but we want to spend a, a lot of time on this uh, conversation about t t 10 biggest missed opportunities in Star Wars TV shows. Uh, and we'll be right back right after this. All right. Uh, we are back here on the Jedi Way. And uh, I pitched this. To both Laura Kelly and Kevin Smets, and they were down with us having this conversation about this article here. It was uh, written by Nathaniel Rourke over at uh, Screen Rant, and I'm going to bring it up uh, real quick. And it essentially is an article that is talking about um, 10 biggest miss opportunities here in Star Wars. It's pretty uh, interesting to see it. Uh, and uh, is it coming up? There it is. There it is. It's coming on screen there. Um, and it's talking about Star Wars shows that have missed opportunities to fully explore their ideas, kind of reanalyzing things 
overall here uh, with some clips uh, uh, interspersed throughout. Uh, but we're going to go through them and then the, we're going to list them all. And then the ones that we want to talk about, we're going to reference after uh, I list them here. But at number 10, they have Ezra Bridger turning to the dark side in Star Wars Rebels Season 3. Certainly something people were talking about as possibility, even even possibly in the Ahsoka series that we saw just recently. Asajj Ventress appearing in Star Wars Resistance Season 2. They did not do that here uh, in that in that series. Seeing how Plo Kloon found Ahsoka in Tales of the Jedi, that's one I'm holding on to for sure. Uh, Din Djarin becoming the ruler of Mandalore in The Mandalorian Season 3. A lot of people thought that was going to happen when he got the Darksaber. Cad Bane's role in The Book of Boba Fett. Sweet Jesus. Uh, the canceled Ahsoka <laughs> slash Darth Sidious arc in Clone Wars, which is a nice little uh, piece of animation there. Uh, the Inquisitors in Obi Wan Kenobi, as they were presented, uh, and then maybe a lot, and then a lot of people felt weren't fully fleshed out. Uh, Merrick, Merrick, the Inquisitor's identity in Ahsoka, which went up in a ball of dust. Dooku betraying Sifodius in Tales of the Jedi, and a what if style Star Wars series for existing characters. So uh, I went to Laura first. Vaughan. I went to Laura first on the Matthew Vaughn. <laughs> so I'm going to go. To you first, Kevin, which one of these stands out for you that you want to talk about first? Um, I want to say that uh, the the Ahsoka Darth Sidious act arc. Okay. Maybe I'm I, I'm this might be an unpopular opinion, but like I love Ahsoka. Um, but we always joke and say the Filoni flex because like Ahsoka is just this badass, right? That's mm -hmm. doing all these things. If you face Darth Sidious, you die. Like Maul, <laughs> Maul tried to take on Darth Sidious, died. His brother died. Mace Windu couldn't do it. Like no, like um, I just I love Ahsoka, but I just think that um, anyone like you don't want anyone coming up away from him and like living. And I know that they, they kind of the rebels they face that like poltergeist of him, right? Or was it him? Yeah. Or you know I get it. But it happening during the Clone Wars, like before he's revealed, like, no, he's supposed to be in the shadows. So I'm glad they didn't do that. I, I would have just felt like that's just like, and I love Filoni and I love Ahsoka, but I would have felt like, all right, he, speaking of, you know, filmmakers and their toys, like his favorite toy is obviously Ahsoka. And if yeah. he's plugging in Ahsoka for this moment right here where she's going to face off with Sidious and live, like, no. Like, yeah. I, I would feel like, and you know, that anyone facing Sidious it's got to die unless you're, you know, Yoda, like, mm -hmm. right. And Yoda got his ass kicked by him. So yeah. um, that was the, that was the one I, I, I know we're going to just kind of ping pong back and forth. Yeah. What do you yeah. guys think of that one? Do you think, would, would you have been down for that one? Yeah. Laura. Well, first of all, if Ahsoka had, had dueled with him, she would have died. And then she would have come back to life because that is what Ahsoka <laughs> seems to do. We have a pattern with this character where she just ping, speaking of ping pong, she just comes back. Um, so that, that actually, that was a new, uh, that was a piece of news to me. I didn't realize that that was like an unfinished Clone Wars arc that they had planned yeah. to do. Um, the author of the article did point out like, this is no longer an option because we got the Clone Wars season right. seven and they took the story in a different direction. And to go back, you would have to basically like retcon stuff. So right. it, it's just not going to happen. But, um, yeah, it, it was interesting that that was even an idea at any point. I, that was news to me and I, I'm not fully opposed to it um i mean there there have been like maul did survive sidious only mm. to then you know come back to life and die again and you know it just goes on and on with him too he seems to have a little bit of that ahsoka <laughs> syndrome too um but yeah th that one was just it was interesting to me but mostly just because i had i didn't know about it john what were your thoughts on this yeah i, I thought it was interesting when i first read about it um and then was like well like Kevin said, like it would have would have been an interesting decision to make. And that certainly speaks volumes to where Filoni felt he could take Ahsoka to take on Sidious and the kind of belief he had in Ahsoka. And this is not Ahsoka now, right? Like seasoned, yeah. experienced. This is a younger Ahsoka. So Sidious would have made mince meat of her. So I have maybe a little too much glorification on Filoni's mind in Filoni's mind about her to have her take on Sidious and somehow survive in this whole thing. Or worse yet, as Laura said, bring her back to life after she died. Uh, I don't think it would have worked at all. And I'm glad they didn't go that route with this and um, left Sidious to have a certain kind of place in Star Wars 
that not a lot of Sith Lords have, to be honest. Uh, and I like that they kept it pristine in that way and let Ahsoka go on her own journey and made the adjustment. But, I mean, yeah, it would have been interesting to see, but you would have had to adhere to what the rules are. And uh, if they let her live, I think it would have had to be something really incredible for the fans to have accepted it and bought it. So, um, all right, Laura, what, what's a choice you have from this list here uh, from Nathaniel work over at Screen Rant? Well, there's a couple of them here that I actually agree with. So okay. I'll, I'll hit maybe those first. Or, I don't know, maybe I should end on those so that it ends on a pause. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> um, first of all, I think the what if idea actually is kind of a cool idea. Lego yes. Star Wars has done a, they've kind of inched along that, those storylines a little bit in some of those specials that they've released over the years. Um, I think it was like the Halloween one in particular. There, there was definitely some of that in there. Um, so I, I, I really like that idea actually. And I think that would be kind of, those would be some fun stories to, to potentially explore. Um, I don't disagree on Cad Bane's fate in the book of Boba Fett. I enjoyed the book of Boba Fett for the most part, but Cad Bane in particular did feel a bit wasted in that show. So those are two points that I agree. Kevin's got a counterpoint though. <laughs> Oh no, you might be muted. Yeah, you're Kevin. muted again, Kevin. Sorry, you muted it. <laughs> it's my first rodeo, of course. Uh, if, if 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 Reva could survive two lightsaber stabs from Vader, Cad Bane could survive the blade stab from Boba Fett. That's all. That's all I wanted to point out. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, keep going, Laura. Keep going. <laughs> no, that's right. That's okay. Um, okay. The only other one that I wanted to point out that I, I certainly uh, agree with is the point that Cass. I, it's not so much that the Inquisitors were not a good addition to Kenobi or weren't well executed. I think casting Rupert Friend was a massive mistake. I'm sorry. Yeah. He's a great actor, but he was not the right choice for that role. That, I mean, you take a character, you take somebody like Jason Isaacs, who was ho like voicing that character in Rebels and put Rupert, it just didn't make any sense and it didn't look great. And yeah. the live action Grand Inquisitor just, it just wasn't it for me. So those, there's a couple of, points in there i kind of i kind of agree with um is there is there anything in here for you guys that stood like what are what are some of the points you made that you're like yeah i can get on board with that for sure oh i can totally get on board with what if i think that's a lot of fun and i love those lego ones um because they had the one with the where c3po was like telling the stories or tales or whatever and he because he has all the memories from everything and so those were a lot of fun to see and i and i like those kind of offshoots uh, that aren't that maybe or may not be canon depending on what they're telling. So a what if, and I know Star Wars Visions, I love both of those seasons. So yeah. to have a what if that explores some more of the story with some higher end level of animation and different styles of animation, I think would have been really, really interesting to see um, and uh, be a part of. So I, I'm down with that. And I hope they still maybe kick around that idea because I like Tales of the Jedi, which is essentially... Not necessarily what if, but certainly kind of offshoot stories to tell that flesh out a little bit more of the canon stories that we know already. So I liked that aspect of it all. And then the other one you brought up here, I think I want to address. Yeah, the Inquisitor thing. I think you're 100% right, Laura. Um, I didn't want to say that about Rupert Friend because I agree with you. He's such a good actor, but kind of wasted and kind of wasn't the right choice overall to convey that... Um, I don't know, that's kind of overwhelming evil in this guy in the sense of unsettlingly a terrifying person. It really wasn't there. It felt comical at times. It felt like cosplaying at times, which is really thing you don't want to have conveyed here. So I think they missed. And there might be more scenes with him that they cut out of this thing because they realized we maybe didn't cast this thing correctly and it didn't 100% come through. So I, I hear you on those two uh, for sure. But the Cad Bane situation... You're never going to get me to accept what happened in Boba Fett. That was so frustrating to me. And ang it just angered me on so many levels. Such a great character to do yeah. that to him in that series, I thought was such a massive mistake. So I agree with that 100%. I mean, one episode and you kill him off that way, I just, for me, was a colossal waste on so many levels. Uh, Kevin, what are your thoughts on any of these? Things? He's alive. He's alive. They, just like, <laughs> okay. Everybody's saying, "Oh, they missed uh, his uh, artery and uh, or Sabine's artery, and she lived the lightsaber." They're, they're gonna be Cad Bane's alien thing. Like his his organs, like whoop, like moved around it, like in the Disney, like, <laughs> the Bunny Bugs Bunny cartoons, where like their body moves around and stuff like that. So he's fine. I say that uh, just because I'm doing the deep dive right of this mm. uh, Star Wars rewatch. Yeah, I'm all for. Uh, 
seen Dooku betraying Sipodius uh, in Tales of the Ooh. Jedi. That would be cool. By the way, it's covered in the Darth Plagueis novel. You find out how they betray Sipodius. Sipodius is actually straight up like worried about uh, visions of an impending war, so he creates the clone army. And in that book, you figure out that Palpatine and Dooku intervene, and they kill Sipodius, and then pretend to be him the rest of the way. And that's that's stuff that's covered. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna gonna be bugging you guys to read that novel over and over. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, and that's that's fine. But let me just point out though, with that same storyline, the Sifo Dio stuff, that is also covered in Dooku Jedi Lost in the canon audio oh. original by Kevin Scott, which is actually it's incredible. It was the first audio original that they did oh was God. Dooku Jedi Lost. Sifo Dius is all over that. He's an amazing character in it, and they kind of get into some of that stuff there. Is that a book? So to um, it you can get the script, so you can you can read the you can read it in book form. But it was, it was it? created as like an audio original um, story that you can listen to. Audio original is it on YouTube then? Like I, I'm one no, of so come it's, on, I'm doing it's my on, deep it's on Audible. So I I mean or wherever you can find audiobooks, you'll find it there. It's basically an audiobook, Sweet. but it's got like audio. a whole cast. It's not just one narrator. There's a whole cast of people that are playing the various nice. characters. It's great. I'll, yeah. I'll, have to, I'll add that to my list. Um. So I think also Ploku finding Ahsoka, that would be cool. And they might do that season two. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the Ezra Bridge returning the dark side, I'm just mentioning it because no, I'm glad they didn't do it. But I just yeah. remember during the last Jedi lead up, um, everybody was convinced that, well, Benicio Del Toro kind of looks like Ezra. And so everybody was waiting for Ezra to turn to the dark side. And then yeah. uh, Benicio Del Toro was going to be the bad guy of the last Jedi, which connected to Rebels. And I just wanted to, to give a shout out to that because I remember when the fan theories about that is funny. But I mean, some I get right. Like this list, like I get like the Asaz Ventress, that's kind of like fan service. I thought the way she goes out in Dark Disciples, cool. And so it's interesting that they were even going to toss that out, um, you know, and have that. Yeah. The Din Djarin, like I love how they handled the Mandalorian with um, Bo Katan. Um, and I think there's been a great quote, I forget, where they talked about that too, about just explaining like that. It's not a, it's not Din's even goal like he doesn't want no. that right um and then like i said cad bane's gonna live the ahsoka yeah and the and for me the obi-wan stuff with the inquisitors like and i agree with it like if the, and you see how well they did when they brought thrawn in the same voice actor so oh, yeah they, they must have not been able to get jason isaacs but i and i think that you didn't need to muddle all that you had so much so much history between obi-wan and anakin that uh, in the first scene when the emperor tells him dispatch the inquisitors vader could have been like no i'm going after obi-wan myself mm. just like no i'm taking him now in attack of the clones with anakin right and just showing his obsession to get obi-wan you didn't need any of that the side inquisitor stuff um, yeah. you know what i mean and this is coming from someone that again it like ranks number one for him but uh so uh i kind of get the missed opportunity for that as well but yeah yeah, any delegating by Vader that isn't working on the Death Star, I just am not a fan of. I mean, there's something about Vader is like I gotta handle it myself because I'm surrounded by a bunch of idiots. So yeah, when, he, when he's when he's delegating to Inquisitor, the Inquisitor is you've got to really make that work, or else it it really will fall flat on its face, and it did, in my opinion, uh, in that series. And so I, yeah, I just it was too frustrating to deal with the Asajj Ventress thing. I think you know I think it was good that they didn't do that. I, it was fine what it was. Resistance is not where you want to bring Asajj Ventress back at all. No offense to Resistance, and yeah, like the like Nathaniel says in the piece, it would have elevated Resistance, sure, but it would have denigrated Asajj, and I think that's not what you want to do with a character like that uh, overall. So it wouldn't no. have worked in my opinion. Yeah, Lord. and Asajj Ventress, her death was such a pivotal moment mm. to quit. Mm. It was such a pivotal thing in like in Quinlan Vos's yeah. story. To undo that would be. Number one, I think such a betrayal to Christy Golden, who wrote an incredible novel. Dark Disciple yeah. is so good. It's such a moving story about these two complex, layered, beloved characters who didn't really... I mean, Quinlan Vos got, like, no play in the Clone Wars, like, yeah. at all. So yeah. it's it's a really great story just of, you know, as his, of his story. But it's really... It really is Asajj Ventress's story, I think, primarily. And it's a great... It's just a great book. So I would hate to see something like that. Yeah. Was that taken from that Clone way. Wars uh, uh, scripts too? Like it, it was yes. un unproduced? Mm -hmm. Yes. Man, yeah, that was... ever came back for a miniseries just to do a, a direct translation of that? 
Yeah, because I think Katie Lucas wrote, didn't she create the character of Sasha yeah. Ventress? Or she wrote some of her original arcs, and I think she was supposed to either write and or direct that arc of episodes mm. in the Clone Wars oh, that cool. unfortunately were not made. But I'm glad that they they brought the story into the canon in the way that they did, because the novel, again, incredible, highly recommend. Yeah, this may be something they explore as they kind of look at ways to keep the brand going and fleshing out the brand more and showing more stories. Massage Ventress, which people have been clamoring for. Look, people clamored for the Ahsoka transition to live action for a long time. So clamoring for Massage Ventress to finally get seen live action or tell a series. I mean, Dark Disciple would be an awesome miniseries to tell. And it's his own insulated story. Yes, it connects up to larger stuff. But like, if you really focus on their story, I think would have would be such a fun miniseries. Almost like taking a page out of wb's book and what they have with the joker and batman that's not necessarily lining up to the to the overall can of what they're trying to tell you can tell these kind of things that are kind of one-offs in their own way still canon but one-offs that don't necessarily have to tie into a larger story and i oh, i like great. that you said kevin a, a miniseries on dark disciple would be a lot of fun to see in the right hands to tell this story for sure i mean maybe finally you are something. live action oh man yeah Maybe that. Rachel, um, sorry, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard would be a great choice to maybe direct something like that. I yeah. Don't know. Or Steph Green. Which or Matthew job. Vaughn. Matthew Vaughn. <laughs> <laughs> Please, no. He does not. He does Who's not. this bald person that's bald? <laughs> Why does this guy have a ten? I don't even know who these characters are. Give me Hob Solo. And I mean, he's not really known for his romance stories in his movies, so I don't <laughs> know if that'd be the right choice for sure. But what about this Ezra Bridger thing? Let's talk about this because this is a big deal. And look, by the way, whether we're positive or negative about these suggestions, it's a fantastic, well-written article by Nathaniel, Nathaniel Rourke. So I want to make sure, because I'm going to tag him probably uh, as in the post for this, but want to make sure this is clear. We, we really appreciated the article. But this idea of Ezra Bridger turning evil, this is something that people had this obsession for through yeah. Rebels. I remember that. And then into Ahsoka, obviously, as we just wrapped up here, that he would be Maroc. It was him as Maroc. It was him doing this kind of stuff. So um, I, I, I'm glad they didn't turn him evil. I'm glad we didn't even approach that possibility. I'm glad that it was what it was as a tease, like Dark Ray. Uh, it's a nice tease, but for the love of God, let's not explore that kind of thing. What did you guys think about this? Uh, what do you guys think overall about people's obsession with Ezra Bridger turning evil? I mean, not it got a little evil. dark there. Sorry, it, it got yeah. a little dark there at the end of Rebels, but I just don't think it was ever going to go that way. It's kind of yeah. already been there, done that. We saw that with Anakin. It would have been a little bit yeah. redundant, I think, to go that yeah. way. So I never really understood the the sort of, I don't know, assumption that it would go that way. Also, My Brother in Christ, it is a kid's TV show. It was on Disney XD. There's only so dark that they can go in reality. I'm just saying. Sorry, Kevin, I interrupted you. <laughs> no, you didn't. No, I know. That's fine. Uh, yeah, it's like watching a Disney cartoon and like Buzz Lightyear goes AWOL and starts killing all the toys in uh, you know <laughs> the, the kid's room like... It's a cartoon. Also, like you said, like redundancy and like not everybody needs to be a dick. Not everybody needs to turn bad. Yeah, like true. already, if I'm a citizen, I would be like, stop the Jedi. Every time there's a Jedi, someone burns it down and then ends the galaxy. Right. Yeah. Like um, so it, it's kind of good. Like let 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 Anakin be the, the, the sole asshole in this equation, you know, for a little bit. Like yeah. so many people fall and like we don't even get started on the redemptions. If you ever looked up. On uh, Wikipedia, there's an article of how many Star Wars redemptions there are of people to going from bad to good. It's crazy, yeah. but yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. Keep them good. Keep them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, Kevin sounded like a lot of Schmodown fans. Does everyone have to go evil? Do they? Have, can't we just uh, have any faces left? I know. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> um, also, the the idea of Din Djarin, This was another thing that Nathaniel has in the article. Din Djarin becoming the ruler of Mandalore because he had gotten the dark saber. And the Mandalorian season three, I actually don't think that's a missed opportunity. I'm glad they didn't explore that because he is not a ruler. It's not his, I mean, yeah. he barely can handle the kid, the baby Yoda, the Grogu. The idea of leading a whole people, that's not something that was ever part of his character. Do you know what I'm saying? There's a reason he became a bounty hunter. There's a reason it's he's doing the things that he's doing. It would, I don't think it would have worked necessarily, even with a Darksaber. For him to lead uh, Mandalore, uh, do you guys think this was a wasted opportunity at all, or or did they go the right route with this? Nah, it's fine. I I agree. Like like I said, I think that Bo Katan was fitting for that. Mm -hmm. Like it was a good overall arc when you can 
you could combine it with Clone Wars, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and the reluctant leader. I just think didn't have uh, more important things, right? Like, uh, and he really starts to care for Grogu. And I think he needs to go off and do adventures. That's him. He's not yeah. meant for politics. I think that was his arc, becoming a guy who let go of the droid hate and yeah. figured out how to become a good father to uh, Grogu. What are your thoughts on this, Lord? I mean, I, I could write a whole dissertation on this. This is not just Nathaniel. So many Star Wars fans wanted this and were calling yes, for this. And true. I just don't understand it because I'm in the same boat as you, John. This is not who Din Djarin is yeah. at all. This is like saying like Han Solo should have been a senator oh. in the New Republic. No. Why would he do that? That is not who he is. Nor is that like who he wants to be. Like Din Djarin is this lone ranger. He's sort of this outlaw. He has a lot of potential for growth in different ways, like Han Solo, he would be more suited to maybe being a captain or a general in a military mm. role. Maybe that, maybe there's room for growth for him there, but becoming that kind of leader, that the becoming the kind of leader, like as a ruler of Mandalore, that just, I just don't think it would make sense for him. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I think people want what's best though for Din Djarin. We all care sure. about this character sure. a lot and we all want to see him succeed. But I think for Din Djarin to be happy and to succeed at this point in his story, he just needs to be a good father and a good mentor to Grogu. And I think that part of that is embracing community around him, which yeah. would be a big challenge for him, potentially yeah. a challenge for him in a later season of The Mandalorian. I'd like to see him tackle something like that someday. But I, I think that it's good intentions that people have when they say this, that they want this for Din Djarin. They just want sure. what's good for him. I, but I don't, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's like, it's kind of mind boggling, honestly. Yeah. And as an actor um, watching this, of course, Kevin is an actor as well. Um, I don't know Laura's experience in the past, but uh, we, as an actor watching this. <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> enough. I didn't see um, Pedro have that element to his performance in vocally in the creating the character. It didn't yeah. seem like that was there, this idea of needing to be part of a community. Like, he could have been part of the Bounty Hunter community. He wasn't one of the guys that walked into the bar and everybody. He wasn't, wasn't Norm from Cheers. Like, that's not his natural personality. He is a, um, a, a bit of an introvert. He keeps to himself. He does what he does because of how he's been damaged and how he interpreted that damage, right? Grief Karga is more someone who would take over Mandalore than maybe uh, Din Djarin. So... It just isn't in his net. And as Laura said, he became a senator in essence or a magistrate. And so it's a, it's a different situation. I don't think Din would have ever wanted that for himself. And I don't disrespect, as Laura so well said, anybody thought that could be something for him or wanted something like that for him. It just, I don't think, would have made sense in the character that had been created through the seasons for him to want all of a sudden to be in charge of an entire planet, you know, so... Um, it just seemed odd. Um, well, let's get into some of the ones that maybe are not on the list here as we're coming, getting close to wrapping up the show. Uh, Laura, I'll go to you first. Are there any that you feel could have been added to this list? I'm going to stay on Din Djarin for a moment because I pretty much all of my things are oh, about go. him. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, First of all, I think he's such an interesting character. Mm -hmm. And after three seasons, how much we've seen how much he's like learned and how much he's grown as a character, but I feel like we're still kind of watching everything from behind a wall because he's just insistent mm. on this helmet thing. Yeah. And what I've been asking myself is was, well, as, as I've been sort of doing a little Mandalorian rewatches, am I being closed minded by mm. rejecting Din's unwavering devotion to the way to the children of the watch and to the helmet? Mm. Because at this point in the story, Bo-Katan seems to have accepted Din for who he is and his commitment to the way. Like, she defends him to the Night Owls. Yeah. But I can't help but think of the helmet as, like, a barrier. Like, Din is physically guarded, and he's never going to be able to truly connect with anyone until he gets past this devotion to the Creed and to his helmet. Grogu is an exception, because Grogu has the ability to sense Din's emotions without seeing his face. But beyond Grogu, I feel like this is, like... A, and not and it's not even just I want to see Pedro Pascal's face, which I think is a missed opportunity. That is part of it. But a bigger part of it is I feel like this character is being hindered in a way. And I feel like there's room to explore that maybe later in a season. But I kind of get the impression that they're not going to go that route. I was sort of getting that at some point. 
But then they, I feel like they kind of backtracked when we got to season three, where there's like, no, he's keeping the helmet on. We're sticking with that. Right. Um, Kevin, your thoughts on what Laura said and any, anyone, any one that you want to suggest that you feel they missed an opportunity on the TV shows. Well, someone needs to call Din Djarin, the Din Djarin's agent and uh, work out the deal so he can come on set. Cause that's obviously <laughs> a Hollywood reason, which is why it's annoying for me too. Like, yeah. I think we would see a lot more of him if, if they were paying him or well, I don't know if they, I don't know about if it was about pay or, but like, he's not on set half the time. Right. He's just, he's in the voiceover oh. uh, right. in the room. So I think that, um, uh, I will, uh, yeah, I think that my, well, I have two, but like one of them you'll just know. Palpatine show, like I said, the Darth Plagueis novel is so good. I'll, I, I scream to the heavens about it. Tom Hiddleston is a young Palpatine. He's in the Disney fold already. Would have been great. Uh, see fan art as young Palpatine oh. with Tom Hiddleston as it. Uh, it would have been cool, uh, you know, do a very, it's Sopranos in space. Like oh, that's what man. people thought that do you, Boba Fett was going to be, but you could have Palpatine's rise is him doing patricide and, and like matricide on his pa parents. Like uh, it's, it's a crazy, if you did like this multi-series, multi-season arc about showing yeah. how he, he encounters and you know, it would be interesting, but my main one is, and we fixed it in my movie so the music in Obi Wan. I'm sorry, I don't agree with the composer when she says he didn't earn the Vader theme yet. Not until the end, he wasn't Vader because they played Vader's theme in literally Attack of the Clones and in Revenge of the Sith. So don't tell me that in Obi Wan, again, my favorite show. I have a lot of complaints about it. Mm -hmm. That in the Obi Wan show, we're not hearing Vader as he's walking. How are you not playing his theme when he's walking down that street? Uh, killing ch children and smashing people through windows looking for Obi-Wan in Fresno or wherever that place was, right? So, like, <laughs> they, just, they definitely needed the music, and my movie fixed that, and we rescored it, not overdid it, but just at parts where it needed, and that is the biggest missed opportunity, and I, I think that it was the ego of the filmmakers and the composer saying, we have this new theme, and it's not a bad theme. It's mm -hmm. the theme that's playing when, like, he has the half helmet on, and it's the theme he's saying, like, uh, Anakin, I am what remains, like, when they're back on Fresno. Like, that whole thing, it's a fine theme, but it's not what it should have been playing when it's Vader and Obi-Wan confronting each other. So music in Obi-Wan Kenobi is the number one missed opportunity wow. that I would have added, and then, of course, a Palpatine show with Tom Hiddleston, which is more, like, fantasy booking, but yeah. That's those are two. It, I, mu music is not something I would have ever like considered as a, but it's a great point you bring up, Kevin. So it opened my mind on that. I, the Hiddleston is interesting because, like, do we want to feel sympathy for Palpatine? Do we want to see him as a tragic figure who went the one route when he could have gone another route? I mean, is that what we no, want? No, it's not. Okay, you do it like like you do it like <laughs> the novel. You don't have any love for Palpatine. You have respect okay. because you're like, wow, he he's so good at like doing everything and how he ends up killing Plagueis, but yeah. I think you could do it. You're right, though. Hollywood would be like, no, you gotta have... Oh, especially else. in Disney's hands. There's no way you wouldn't make yeah. him somewhat sympathetic. What do you think, Laura? Well, I'm thinking, I mean, my mind's going immediately to the new Hunger Games movie that's coming out, mm. where they've basically yeah. done that with President Snow, and like, yes. seem to be sort of making him this sympathetic character, giving him this whole backstory. As I understand it, this is based on a book that I have not read. Yeah, um, I read it. So, I, did you? I'm like, was that successful did they somehow pull it off where they make him as like a sympathetic yeah, it's character before, but yeah it's like because it's before he you just kind of get in it's a long time since i read it but you get mm -hmm. informed of why he is the way he is and like you know not everybody starts out like twirling their mustaches it's you get there a certain way things shape you and things happen and some messed up things happen to him i don't want to spoil it but uh okay. it's a good book i liked it um and so i think uh, he just kind of had to live in a world where he had to adapt. And then, uh, you know, uh, he ends up being what he is. So there is, I mean, in, in the novel, like, yeah, you're really just kind of like respecting him for all the machinations and the stuff he's doing and yeah. uh, pulling all the strings. Uh, but like breaking bad, like once he breaks bad for a while, like, you know, it's like a wrestling, like you start rooting for someone a little bit, then they turn bad and then you're rooting against them. And, and like the same thing, like, I think there could be parts where like, you're like, ah, oh, man, I wish Palpatine didn't do that. But like, then there's other people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, Why did he kill his parents? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, it was so good. <laughs> it is a brutal chapter when he murders his family. Oh uh, yes, it, it yeah, it is crazy. He kills his I've kids. Or he, I know it's been out so long, so I'm just mm -hmm. trying to rope Laura into wanting to read it. 
but he slaughters his parents on like a I think it's like a spaceship. It's been a while since I read that section, but like he slaughters his parents like on a spaceship. And I just remember it, it reminded me of like Alien. Like mm-hmm. just the way wow. he was just, just yeah. Full of anger that one. <laughs> wow. Uh, I've got three of them. They're real quick. Um uh the number one, I think for me. Uh, is I think well number one number one not in the terms of Im- importance but the number one that comes to mind for me was I wish we had gotten Leia and Ahsoka I really do I wish we had gotten Leia and um, Mon Mothma having these interactions around what Ahsoka and Hera and Sabine were all doing and dealing with Bail and dealing with, like all this stuff there was some real interesting things that could have happened in terms of the conversations and we saw that in Andor. The stuff that Mon Mothman was going through, the political moves, and as you said, Kevin, the machinations here that were going on with uh, Stellan Skarsgård's character, we could have had an element of that in Soka that I think would have really made the the show even more resonant, and I would have liked to have seen that. I know that would have meant either recasting or CGIing Leia, but I still would have liked to have seen it. Just could we have more with Genevieve O'Reilly because she's so wasted on the show to have had her have more of the of the back and forth and the figuring out and all of that i think would have been very interesting to explore um the second thing is and again i go back to original trilogy character i think luke should have been a bigger part of uh that season with uh, um the man with the book of boba fett i think luke training uh grogu having all of that going on at the same time that boba is doing what he's doing at kind of mirroring this idea of these two characters taking on a new approach to the world, being changed by the experiences that they're going through, to have more of that so that when Grogu chooses to go back to Mando, you've done the work to show why he made that decision rather than just one episode where we don't even see what happened other than some kind of meditation and then boom, he's going. I would have liked to have seen them make that a running storyline through the whole season of that show because you didn't have a strong enough lead. No offense to Tamora Morrison. He's not strong enough to lead a Disney plus show to get a lot of people to watch. The balance could have been a um, CGI would Mark Hamill or some way de-aged Mark Hamill, something where it would have been really interesting to see that. Uh, And I think my last one also is book of Boba Fett is there should have been more with the Tusken Raiders. I thought that was a massive mistake to have doing such a great job building that up. And then it just, the, the, uh, the fucking hole just drops out from under the story and there was more of the Native American connection or Native connection, that, depending on what country you're from, that you could have explored that the Tuscans represented that I think Disney dropped the ball on. And this is my frustration overall with Disney, with Marvel and Star Wars, is that they bring these really interesting topics up that have much more nuance and complications to them and don't explore any of that and just do broad overview. And I think in 2020, the 2020s, we're kind of done with broad overviews. And we see that happening now with the, and I'm not going to get real world on this, but we see this happening now with the arguments that are going on back and forth in our real lives about this uh, thing that's happening uh, overseas. It's important to kind of explore that if you're going to bring up these issues. So those are my missed opportunities, recent stuff that didn't come to mind. Um, any anything, any comments on those or any new ones for you guys as we head to the end of the show? I think I fully agree with all of your points, but I do think that Mm. the actor who played Luke with all that CGI on his Mm. face in the book of Boba Fett did not need any of that. He looks and sounds enough like Luke Skywalker without it. And to kind of go back to some of Matthew Vaughn's points at the beginning of our show, I think that these characters need to transcend the actors that played them. And I would be fully on board if they wanted to bring more Luke into it. I think that would have actually been a really good move to like, thread the Grogu story throughout all of those episodes so that one, the time period was a little bit more clear. I think we learned later when somebody came out, one of the creators was just like, Oh no, he was with Luke for a long time. I'm like, what? Like I, I, it was, uh, it was Favreau. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. Jesus Christ. Um, Well, they they, they ran into a problem. They wanted to call it the book of Luke, but then the Bible was like, (laughs) wow. (laughs) I'm confused. Taken. (laughs) Um, I do have one more point. Yeah. I wanted to, one more missed opportunity that I wanted to bring up. And I apologize because I have brought it up before. But I'm going to hit it again. <laughs> Romance is a missed opportunity yeah. in Star Wars. It is a genre that is missed. 
There are some of it in the books, even the but even the books, they hold back. And it's really wow. frustrating to me. I just need one. I need one romance in Star Wars that doesn't end in complete and utter tragedy. I need a romance <laughs> that is allowed to play out over any period of time before one of them dies in the arms of the other or gets blown up. Like, and heaven forbid that these shows, like, that these men that are running these shows have, like, a single thought of the possibility of romance in Star Wars. Because yeah. just them wanting to sit and play with their action figures and not invite girls into the clubhouse. And I just want a little bit of romance in my stories. I'm sorry. Lost Stars, I forget the ending, so that might have been it. Lost Stars, track, yeah. That's but Lost cool. Stars series would have been really cool on Disney+. Plus. Yeah. Uh, For sure. That, that I think that book, probably, I like that book uh, as much, if not more, than Plagueis. Like, it's a really good book. Yeah. Um, that would have been a good show. I agree with you on that. I agree with yeah. you on those points. And also, as far as the reverence of Carrie, I think that if you ask Carrie Fisher, hey, uh, oh, if you were able to have a seance with her and be like, hey, look, we're really running into this problem where we only have deleted scenes for Rise of Skywalker, but we have this great script. Can we cast someone? She would be. She would want Leia to have her fully freshed out, fleshed out original story totally. that was meant for her. She would have said, recast me. She would have been like, you idiots. Why haven't you recasted me already? Like, so, and I mean, I can't presume that that, but I just feel in my soul that she loves the character so much that she would want the character to have the full story instead of just whatever we could piece together with existing footage, which is the biggest drawback for uh, Rise of Skywalker for me. It just instantly takes me out because yeah. one of the scenes where she says never underestimate a droid was released as a deleted scene in the Force Awakens Blu-ray. So true. when she says never right. underestimate a droid to Ray, you're like, you're using deleted scene footage that i've already seen it's crazy to me so yeah sorry another show for another no, time no. laura, laura you're making an excellent man. point Thanks. yeah you make an excellent point laura about romance and and i wonder if it's something they've tested and they're like now nah, the nerd kids don't want to see this i don't know because i agree with you it, it, there needs to be more of that it's one of the things that we loved about the original trilogy was the romance between leia and han and of course we know how that ends up now with the sequel trilogy but like we loved that, and that was one of the biggest elements of why I think that original trilogy worked. So the fact they can't seem to replicate it in any of the newer stuff, and and I know people love the prequel trilogy. I'm not going to hurt anybody's I'm, I'm trying not to hurt anybody's feelings, but I didn't buy the romance at all between those guys. So to me, there was something more we can explore in these newer projects that need to happen. And I imagine these people have successful romantic relationships, so why can't you bring that? into the things you are creating. I don't know about if, I don't know if Filoni's married or not. I don't get involved. But he is. I imagine, yeah. yeah, Favreau, I imagine. is So why not have that as an element? And I wonder if Disney feels like, oh, let's not open the door to that. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting point. There needs to be some some romance brought back in Star Wars. Hopefully. Probably. Yeah, they didn't even really have a romance story in the sequel trilogy, right? Like No, they, they, they walked away. There was rumors about Ray and Finn, but then they never really explored yeah, it. Yeah, they never did it. Oh, yeah. It's like Ray and Ben solo a little bit, yeah. right in the rise of sky, right. right there at the end. That was it again, dying in each other's arms. It doesn't get to play out. Like, I'm come on, you guys. I just have this image of you in the theater when he died and then disappeared, like, son of a bitch. Yeah, I was not. Like, if you would have lived, we could have had more movies with the two of them. Raylo. <laughs> he was half naked in the last movie. All right, anyway, let's wrap it up here. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us for this episode of The Jedi Way. This sped along, so this was a lot of fun. I always enjoy talking with these two about Star Wars. It's, it always enlightens me, and it always uh, leaves me with a big smile on my face afterwards uh, talking about one of the best franchises ever. Um, uh, Kevin, thanks again for joining us. Ke where can they find you and where everything you got going on, brother man? Yeah, at Kev Smets. Uh, you can find me there. And then the uh, subsequent Star Wars show I do, Scoundrels, Inc., uh, so with no Star Wars shows to talk about, we talked about what our favorite crawls were. That was kind of an interesting Ooh, uh, conversation nice we had this discussion. week. It's, it's good. Uh, we had a good discussion about that. So you can check that out over there. And then also my KOTOR movies. Uh, man, I still got to fix that URL. Is so <laughs> don't worry about it. Just search KOTOR movie trilogy. Maybe you find it. No, I don't know. Long live Revan. Well, I'll figure it out. Next week. <laughs> and uh, I'll get that photo, Roca. I, I I knew you were going to give me shit on the show today. Like, I got to get that. I just got to do this, right? Well, I got to figure out my pose. I, I just bought a new program that allows me to do video and put animated things into video. So I may just do it myself and have like a post it with your name that gets popped up. There. Um, <laughs> no, I'll, get, I'll get it. Right on. Uh, Laura, another fun show. Always great doing with you. Please uh, let people know what you got going on, everything uh, that is going on in your world. 
Yeah, come find me on Twitter and Instagram at shutup underscore Laura. And then my other show is called Forced Toast to Star Wars Happy Hour. You can find that on Twitter and Instagram at Forced Toast Pod. Um, Alice and I will have a new episode out on Tuesday. And frankly, I have no idea what we're going to talk about because, yeah, <laughs> there's no shows coming out. There's no new comics that we're reading. There's We only read the High Republic comics and there isn't a new one out for a while. So I don't know. We're winging it. It'll be fun. <laughs> Is there a new book coming? I thought I saw something about a new book. Am I wrong on this? I have, I have Darkness. The High Republic, I Have yes. Darkness is the first adult novel of phase three of The High Republic. I have the advanced reader um, nice. ebook that I'm reading. I'm absolutely loving it. So I'm really excited for when it actually does come out. I think it's mid-November, early November. Um, but nice. yeah, until that comes out and until we get closer to it, we can't talk about it. So <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> There you go. Uh, as for me, at the Roka says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, the Outlaw Nation on Twitch. Can't have, encourage you all enough to please subscribe to the channel. If you like the content here on the channel, would appreciate your subscription and hit that like button as well. Uh, and leave a comment down below. Let us know what your uh, missed opportunities in Star Wars TV shows have been. Let us know if you agree or disagree with the points we brought up and with the article from Nathaniel Rourke there at Screen Rant. Let us know what you thought about it all uh, there in the comment section. We always love hearing from you all, and you all drop some great comments and some really interesting nuanced takes on all this kind of stuff so we appreciate that madly uh, all right let's get on out of here laura what do we have to tell them until next time remember your focus determines your reality yeah.